أعوذ بالله السميع العليم من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وصلى الله على محمد وعلى آله وصحبه من تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين رضيت بالله ربا وبالإسلام دينا وبمحمد صلى الله عليه وسلم رسولا ونبيا رب أعوذ بك من همزات الشياطين وأعوذ بك رب أن يحضرون ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم Continuing on with the biography of uh, Abu Bakr Siddiq, uh, this is the legendary legacy of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's military legacy. Now in the chapter on Usama ibn Zaid, his uh, army that was uh, set to go out prior to Allah's messenger's demise. During the lifetime of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, there were two major empires that bordered the Arabian Peninsula, the Roman Empire and the Persian Empire. As for the former, it controlled large areas of land in the northern part of the peninsula. The rulers of those areas acted as viceroys for the Roman Emperor. They were appointed by the empire and were completely under the empire's control. The Romans had a very low opinion of the Arabs who lived in the peninsula. They didn't even deem it worthwhile their while to seize control of the entire peninsula. They were somewhat annoyed when they heard what was taking place. Arabs were getting organized under the banner of the same religion, wanting to teach a lesson to what they considered to be an upstart nation. The Romans made certain incursions towards the south. Meanwhile, the Prophet ﷺ sent messages towards the northern areas of the peninsula, areas that were collectively known as the religion of Asham, Syria, and surrounding regions. For example, he sent Dahiya al Kalbi radiallahu anhu with a letter to Haraqal, the emperor of Rome, in it. The Prophet ﷺ invited Haraqal to Al Islam to his own discredit. Haraqal turned away from the truth, refusing to accept that invitation. The Messenger of Allah وسلم, was forced with the difficult situation. Arabs were entering into the fold of Al-Islam in droves. And yet almost all Arabs felt the same way about the Romans. They were terrified of them. The Roman Empire was, after all, one of the only two empires, superpowers of the era. The Prophet ﷺ's strategy for dealing with the widespread fear of the Romans was clear, to imbue the hearts of Muslims with a sense of confidence. He ﷺ took the offensive against the Romans, which had twofold effect of making the Romans doubt themselves and their control over the region, and of making Muslims believe that they had it in them, with the help of Allah to stand up to their Roman Neighbors. The Prophet ﷺ began by sending out armies to attack the northern areas of the peninsula, lands that were under the control of Romans, but that were inhabited by Arabs. In the seventh year of the Hijriya, the Messenger of Allah sent out an army that clashed with a force that consisted of Romans and Christian Arabs. The battle that ensued became known as the Battle of Mota'a. And during the course of its events, martyrdom was achieved by all the Muslim armies appointed leaders, Zayd ibn al-Harith, Ja'far ibn Abi Talib, and Abdullah ibn Rawaha. When the last of them died, the sword of Allah, Khalid ibn al-Walid, took control of the army and against tremendous odds was able to return with almost all of his soldiers back to safety in al Madina al Nabawiyah. Then in the ninth year of the Hijriya, Allah's Messenger set out with a, a huge army towards Asham, Syria and surrounding regions. The army reached Tabuk, but no fighting took place between the Muslims and the Romans, nor did any fighting take place between the Muslim and the Arab tribe that inhabited the region. Instead, the rulers of nearby cities decided to sign peace treaties with the Messenger of Allah وسلم, and as a result of those treaties, they agreed to pay the jizya tax to the Muslims. The journey was fruitful in many other ways as well. For example, the Muslims were able to put on a strong show of force against the Romans who were unwilling to fight against the Prophet and his army. Also during the course of a long and arduous journey from al Madina to Tabuk, the Muslims were being trained for future battles against the Romans. Battles that would take place after the Prophet ﷺ's demise, after having spent 20 nights at Tabuk, the Muslim army embarked upon their return journey to al Madina. 
And finally, in the year 11th of the Hijriyyah, the Prophet ﷺ informed of his, his companions that he would be sending out an army to fight the Romans in al balqa and Palestine. Among those who were prepared to go were the most eminent members of the Muhajirin and the Ansar. And in a decision that was surprising to a great many of them, the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam appointed the very young Usama ibn Zayd to lead the army. Al-Hafid ibn Hajar, may Allah ta'ala have mercy on him, wrote, It is reported that Usama's army was completely ready on Saturday, two days before the Prophet alayhi salatu wa sallam had passed away. But the actual preparations of the expedition began much earlier prior even to the final illness of the Prophet alayhi salatu wa sallam. In fact, it was the end of the month of Safar. That the Prophet ﷺ first exhorted his people to get ready to attack the Romans. Later on, the Prophet ﷺ summoned for Usama and said to him, Go to where your father was killed and trample them, the enemy, down with your horses, for indeed I have placed you. I have placed you in charge of this army. Some people voiced their skepticism over Usama bin Zaid's appointment to lead the army. He was, after all, young and relatively inexperienced. Furthermore, the army consisted of men who had participated alongside the Prophet ﷺ in many previous battles and who had more proven their worth of the battlefield. Even Abu Bakr Siddiq and Umar radiallahu anhuma were a part of the army, of Usama's army. So why some people asked, was Usama? being chosen to lead them. What they did not understand was that it was not their place to question the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam once he made a final decision and he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam made that point amply clear when he said إِن تَطَعَنُوا فِي إِمَارَتِهِ فَقَدْ تَعَنْتُمْ فِي إِمَارَتِ أَبِيهِ مِنْ قَبْلِ وَإِن مُنَّ اللَّهَ وَأَيْمُ اللَّهَ إِنْ كَانَ لَخَلِيقًا لِإِمَارَتِي وَإِنْ كَانَ لَمْ أَحَبِّ النَّاسِ إِلَيَّ وَإِنَّ هَذَا لَمِنْ أَحَبِّ النَّاسِ إِلَيَّ بَعْدَهُ If you are critical of his leadership, well, then you were also critical of his father's leadership in the past. By Allah, he was indeed worthy of being a leader and he was among the most beloved of people to me. Now that he has departed from this world, for Zaid radiallahu anhu had been martyred in the battle of uh, Muta'a as mentioned. This one, Osama bin Zaid, is among the most beloved of people to me. Two days after the preparation of Osama's army had commenced, Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam fell ill this, at this point. That was clear to all observers was not a mild case of cold or fever. No, this was different. The Prophet ﷺ was seriously ill, and the pain he felt rather than subside increased in intensity. Everyone was worried, and the situation even affected the Prophet ﷺ's plan to attack the Romans. For given situations, Osama's army, rather than head out towards Asham, remained encamped at al Juri which was situated only three miles north of al Madina, And after the Prophet ﷺ passed, Osama radiallahu anhu understandably returned to al Madina. With the death of the Prophet ﷺ, the situation for Muslims changed completely. I'm not referring here to the sadness that they felt upon the Prophet ﷺ's demise. Instead, I am pointing to, to, to how a great Many Arabs in neighboring lands apostatized, some of them outright apostatized, becoming followers of false prophets, and also did so by, or so others did so by refusing to pay the zakah, obligatory charity, one of five pillars of Al Islam. Aisha radiallahu anha, excuse me, described the chaos that, ex- that ensued. Excuse me, when the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam passed, all Arabs apostatized and hypocrisy appeared everywhere. By Allah, what descended upon me, according to another narration, she didn't say me, but rather my father was such, was so severe that were it to be descend upon firm, upon firm and unshakable mountains, it would have crushed them. With so many apostates, to deal with. Throughout the peninsula, the Muslims had to ask themselves whether they could afford to send out Osama's army to Rome. 
Despite the Muslims' need for extra fighters, Abu Bakr Siddiq asked a man to make the following announcement only three days after the Prophet ﷺ's passing. Let Usama's army go out and complete its mission. Lo, let no member of Usama's army spend the night in al Madinah. Instead, let each of them leave immediately for the encampment in al Jurf. After this announcement was made, Abu Bakr Siddiq stood before the people, praised Allah and glorified Him, and then said, O oh people, I am like you, I do not know. Perhaps you will heap upon me responsibilities which only the Messenger of Allah وسلم, was able to bear. Verily, Allah chose Muhammad وسلم, from among all living beings, and He, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and He, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, protected him from defects and errors. Allah chose him from defects and errors. As for me, I am not an innovator. Rather, I am nothing more than a follower. I, if I become upright in my affairs, in a way I rule over you, then follow me. But if I go astray, then correct me. When the Messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala passed on, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, not a single person from this nation was able to claim that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had wronged him in the least. Lo, indeed, is the shaitan attacks me, so when he comes to me, stay away from me. Verily, there are some people who have forgotten their appointed terms, their debts, and have worked for others instead of deeds for their own hereafter. So beware of becoming like them. Work hard, work hard, be quick, be quick. Seek out safety, seek out safety, for behind you is a quick pursuer, time or death. Be vigilant and ready for death and learn from the lessons of your father's sons and brothers. Abu Bakr Siddiq also stood up and having praised and glorified Allah said, Allah accepts only those deeds that are done for the sake of his countenance. So perform your deeds for Allah. Be sincere for the time when you will be poor and needy. Example, when you will be in need of reward in the hereafter. O slaves of Allah, learn a lesson from those among you who have passed. And reflect on those who have come before you. Think, where were they yesterday and where are they today? Where are the tyrants who were renowned for victories in the wars they waged? Time has caused them to waste away. and Now their bodies are rotten and decay. And where are the kings who more than anything else were in armored with lands and with buildings on those lands. They are far away now and no one remembers them. It is as if they are non-existent. But they are not really non-existent for Allah, the possessor of mighty majesty, has kept alive for them the consequences of their actions. Though he has cut off from them their desires, now that they are gone, their deeds remain theirs. Though the world which they once claimed to own has fallen into the hands of others. Now here we are as their successors on earth. If we truly learn from them, we will be saved. But if we sink to their depths and ways, we will be just like them. Where are the beautiful-faced ones who were so enamored with their youth? They have become dust, and the things regarding which they were negligent have become a curse, a cause of misery. Shush me for them. Where are the kings who built cities, fortified them with walls, and built wondrous things inside of them? They have left all of that for those who have come after them. Their homes are empty while they are now in the darkness of their graves. Come, ahlakna qabalahum min qarnin hal tuhissu minhum min ahadin aw tasma'u lahum rikza. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, And how many a generation before them have we destroyed? Can you, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, find a single one of them or hear even a whisper of them? This is ayah number 98, surah number 19, surah Maryam. Where are the ones you knew from among your fathers and brothers? Their terms on earth have ended and they are now sent back to face that which they had sent forward when they were alive. Having died, they are headed either towards happiness or misery. Lo, Allah has no partners and there is no family relationship between him and anyone from among his created beings. And so he does not give anyone good things or protect anyone from evil based on such a relationship. Since such a relationship is non-existence, example, in this world we can ex we, we can expect a family member to give us out of sense 
of familial love, familial love and loyalty. But since no such relationship exists between us and Allah, we are only His slaves and created beings. We cannot expect to receive help from Him for the same reason. What Allah has in term of reward is achieved by us only through our being obedient to Him. The preceding sermon contains many important lessons, a few of them being as follows. Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu anhu, this is a bulletin, made it clear that he was a mere common human being and that he like others and unlike the Prophet that he that like others and unlike the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was prone to falling into error. The difference between the Prophet alayhi salatu wa sallam and Abu Bakr is clear from their titles. The former is the Messenger of Allah and the latter is the Khalifa of the Messenger of Allah. The former is described with his title as having a direct link with Allah. The latter is described as having a direct link with the Messenger of Allah, being a mere human who has or who was not protected from falling into error. Bakr Siddiq told his audience that he would not invent new ways of governing his people, but would instead follow the implement and implement the methodology of governance that was laid out in the Sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So as to preserve the Islamic identity of his government, Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu anhu informed his audience that they were responsible for holding him accountable for his deeds and for making sure that he was that he remained upright and upon the truth during his this is uh, next uh, bulletin c during the, his sermon abu bakr siddiq said two very interesting things that require some explanation when the messenger of allah passed on no one from this nation was able to claim that the prophet had wronged him in the least and though indeed the shaitan the evil attacks me so when he comes to me, stay away from me. What did Abu Bakr Siddiq mean by these statements? Well, Abu Bakr Siddiq wanted to make it clear that because the Prophet Sallallahu was protected from falling into error, he never wronged anyone in the least. But Abu Bakr Siddiq was not protected from falling into error and there was the off chance that he might wrong someone in a moment of anger. For it is when one is angry that one is most likely to harm others. Since in so in essence Abu Bakr Siddiq was at once warning people and asking for their help. He radiallahu anhu warned them to stay away from him when he became angry, when the shaitan came to him so that he could be safe from harming others. For what he most ardently wanted was to follow the sunnah of the Prophet والسلام, and to thus steer clear of harming others even in the smallest of ways. Abu Bakr Siddiq disliked all too well that the shaitan, the devil, came to him on a frequent basis, just as shaitan comes to every human being. After all, Allah has entrusted to every human being a companion from the angels and a companion from the jinn. What is more, the shaitan flows through the son of Adam like a flowing of blood. The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Illa wa qad wukila bihi qarinuhu min al-malaikati wa qarinuhu min al-jinn. There is no one except that Allah has entrusted to him a companion from the angels and a companion from the jinn. Someone asked, and even you, O Messenger of Allah, he said, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, wa ana illa anna Allah a'anani. عَلَيْهِ فَأَسْلَمَ فَلَا يَأْمُرُنِي إِلَّا بِخَيْرٍ Even me, except that Allah has helped me to overcome him, the companion of the jinn that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa had with him, as a result of which he embraced Islam, and so he orders me only to that which is good. It is reported in another hadith that one night as he was walking with Safiyyah, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam passed by two people from the Ansar. Rather than continuing on his way, the Prophet alayhi salatu wa sallam called out to the two men, Ala rislikuma innaha safiyyatun bintu huyayin. Slow down, she is Safiyya bintu huyay. He said, he, he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam then said, Inni khashitu an يَقْذِفَ الشَّيْطَانُ فِي قُلُوبِكُمَا شَيْئًا إِنَّ الشَّيْطَانَ يَجْرِي مِنَ الْإِبْنِ آدَمَ مَجْرَى الدَّمِّ 
which means uh, verily i fear that the shaitan the, the the shaitan the devil would cast something into your hearts that for example he would make you think that i was walking with a strange woman for indeed the shaitan flows through the son of adam like the flowing of blood in short abu bakr siddiq meant to say that unlike the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he was not protecting from falling into error and that he was absolutely true for him for the rest of the Prophet ﷺ's companions and for all other human beings. D. In all of his sermons, Abu Bakr al-Siddiq strove to advise the Muslims and remind them about death. In the foregoing sermon, his words were filled with images of people who were once on this earth, but who then died, taking with them nothing but their deeds. Abu Bakr al-Siddiq used a imagery and eloquent speech show us what a powerful speaker he was radiallahu anhu in fact it is safe to say that he was the most eloquent speaker among all the prophets sallallahu alaihi wasallam's companions he radiallahu anhu had the rare ability of saying a great deal with only a few simple words consider just a few of his famous sayings seek out death and you shall be granted life the most truthful form of truthfulness is trustworthiness and the most the worst kind of lying is treachery and patience is half of iman and certainly is iman in its entirety and certainty is iman in its entirety these are the sayings of a man who was wise and who had the ability of expressing his wisdom with an economic call and downright frugal use of words flowering elaborate speech might have its place in poetry or literature but no sermon is as beautiful as the one that imparts much meaning but that is sparing in its use of words some of today's speakers and preachers would do well to compare their one hour long sermon with the at most 10 minutes foregoing sermon that was delivered by abu bakr siddiq the claim is often made that in these times people need more explanation and clarification regarding ayahs of the Quran and saying of the Prophet وسلم, and so sermons need to be longer. This claim though is it has some validity to it should certainly not be used as an excuse for long wind windedness and over elaboration. Hence the importance for both preachers and imams of both gaining Islamic knowledge and learning how to become an effective and eloquent speaker effective and eloquent speaker the final decision regarding the army of usama bin zaid some of the prophet والسلام, companions suggested to abu bakr siddiq that he should call off the expedition and keep the men of usama's army close by in al Madina. these men made up of the majority of all muslims they argued for the arabs as you can clearly see have shaken free of you and are plotting to destroy you and all muslims so it is not wise to allow a group of Muslims who are needed for fighting to leave you. The Prophet ﷺ's companions were united in this issue and they had every reason to fear for the safety of Bakr Siddiq and of the Muslims who lived in al Madina. Apostasy was not a limited phenomenon. Rather, it was a widespread problem that afflicted most areas of the peninsula al Madina was under direct threat of an attack and all available fighters were needed to defend it given the bleak situation it did not make sense to many of the companions to send out an army to a foreign country when it was needed to defend the homeland yes everything they said made complete sense but they were forgetting one important factor it was the messenger of allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam who had ordered usama's army radiyallahu anhu to lead an army to attack the Romans, had the army been mobilized by any other person of Bakr Siddiq, would certainly have disbanded the army and used its and used its abilities, the soldiers, for his war against the apostates. But given the reality of the situation, his conscience forbade him from acting contrary to what the Prophet ﷺ had originally wanted from Osama's army. And so he stood alone opposite to the rest of the Prophet ﷺ's companions who unanimously agreed that it was best to use Osama's army's soldiers not to attack the Romans but for the upcoming war against the apostates. 
From his encampment in Al-Jurf, Usama radiallahu anhu sent Umar ibn al-Khattab on his behalf asking permission to return with his soldiers to al Madinah. His message to Abu Bakr was as follows, I have with me not only the best of Muslims but also the majority of all Muslims since many of the peninsula have apostatized. And I fear for the safety of the Khalifa of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam of the inviolable city of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and of all Muslims. I fear that each of the foregoing will be attacked by the polytheists, by the mushrikeen. But Abu Bakr Siddiq insisted that the army continue on its course towards Asham. Come what may, Abu Bakr insisted. He was not going to swerve away from what had already been planned by the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The companions began by politely suggesting that he change his mind, but then he implored, but then they implored him to do so over and over again, and yet they could not conceive him to follow their advice. Abu Bakr Siddiq knew that he was in the right, but he could not simply refuse to listen to Umar bin Khattab and the other companions. He felt that he had to give them the opportunity to discuss the matter in future detail with him. And so he invited the people of the Muhajirin and the Ansar to hold a meeting with him. During the course of that meeting, a long discussion took place between Abu Bakr Siddiq and other companions of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The most vice furious opponent of Abu Bakr Siddiq planned course of action was Umar bin Khattab, who expressed his fear that the Khalifa, the city of al Madinah, and all of its inhabitants were in danger of being captured or destroyed by the apostates Arabs. Abu Bakr Siddiq listened carefully to what everyone had to say. When the meeting was concluded, Abu Bakr Siddiq decided to give the others the opportunity to voice their opinions once more. And so he called for a second meeting that was to take place in the Prophet Wasallam's masjid. In that meeting, he radiallahu anhu, asked the companions to forget the idea of cancelling the mission of Osama's army, a mission that was planned and organized by none other than the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam himself. Leaving no room for further discussion, he told them that he was going to send out Osama's army even if doing so meant that the apostate Arabs would seize control of al Madinah. And he radiallahu anhu stood up and delivered the following sermon to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's companions. By the one who has the soul of Abu Bakr in his hand, had I thought that wild predatory animals would make off with me, I would still send out Usama's army in accordance with what the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa commanded Usama to do. And even if I were the last person to remain in these cities, I would still do the same. Yes, Abu Bakr al-Siddiq was from a purely moral standpoint absolutely right, for it was his duty to execute the orders of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa What is more, he radiallahu anhu was proven right. From a practical point of view, the results of his decisions were favorable for the Muslim nation and the Muslims came out victorious over all of their enemies. Even after other companions capitulated to Abu Bakr Siddiq's final decision, some of them, particularly certain members of the Ansar, still had misgivings about Osama being in charge of their army. They wanted something older and more experienced and so they sent Omar bin Khattab to bring up the matter before Abu Bakr Siddiq. Umar said to Abu Bakr Siddiq, Rarely the people of the Ansar are demanding someone who is older than Usama. No sooner did Umar bin Khattab utter these words than Abu Bakr Siddiq jumped up from where he was sitting and took hold of Umar's beard. He radiallahu anhu was to be sure very angry. In a very angry tone, he says to him, Your mother be bereaved of you, O son of Al-Khattab. He exclaimed, It was the Messenger of Allah who appointed him, and now you are ordering me to dismiss him from this position as the leader of the army. Feeling ashamed for what he had just asked for, Umar bin Khattab went outside in a dejected mood. His companions who had been waiting for him to come out asked, What did you do? He radiallahu anhu responded, Go away, may your mothers be bereaved of you. See what treatment I received from the Khalifa of Allah's Messenger because of you. Later on, Abu Bakr Siddiq went out in order to bid the men of Osama's army farewell and to walk alongside them for a short while. Upon reaching Osama's soldiers, Abu Bakr Siddiq gave them a look of appraisal and then walked alongside them as long as they departed for their expedition. Abu Rahman ibn Awf radiallahu anhu steered Abu Bakr's riding animal 
since Abu Bakr had chosen to walk. Usama, who was seated on his riding animal, turned to Abu Bakr Siddiq and said, O oh, Khalifa of Allah's Messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, by Allah you will indeed ride or I will come down and walk alongside you. Bakr Siddiq responded, by Allah you will not descend and by Allah I will not ride. For what harm will it do to me to get my feet covered in dust as I walk in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Bakr Siddiq knew he had made the right decision, but as he walked alongside Osama, there was one thing that was bothering him. One of the soldiers in Osama's army was Umar bin Khattab, Bakr Siddiq radiallahu anhu's most trusted advisor. Yes, Umar bin Khattab had disagreed with Abu Bakr about sending out Osama's army, but that was what made him such a valuable advisor. He radiallahu anhu was sincere and was always willing to speak his mind and give the outbreak of the apostasy in the region. The Abu Bakr Siddiq needed Umar by his side now more so than at any time. Also, perhaps there was something else in Abu Bakr's mind as well. Perhaps he was looking to the future and wanted to keep Umar by his side. In order to give him the training, he needed to replace him as the next Khalifa of the Muslim nation. Whatever the case of Bakr Siddiq radiallahu anhu said to Osama bin Zayd, if you think it is okay to provide me with Omar's services by discharging him from your army, then do so. Osama granted him his request, after which Abu Bakr Siddiq faced the soldiers and said, O oh people, stop, so that I can advise you regarding the ten matters. Memorize them from me. Do not be treacherous. Do not wrongly take the spoils of war before they are properly distributed. Do not deceive and do not mutilate fallen enemy soldiers. Do not cut down a tree that bears fruit. Do not slaughter a sheep, a cow, or a camel unless you do so in order to feed yourselves. Verily, you will pass by a people who have completely dedicated their lives to living in monasteries. Leave them alone and let them continue doing what they what is what it is they have dedicated themselves to doing. To do. Also, you will come across a people who will come to you with a dish that contains in it many colors of food. If you eat something from it and then eat something else from it, mention the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala over it, and you will also meet a people who have shaved the centers of their heads and have left everything around the center of their foreheads in such a way that they look like headbands or perhaps braids. Use all of your strength to fight them with your swords. Go forth in the name of Allah. Having advised the soldiers of the army, Bakr Siddiq addressed Usama specifically, telling him to follow the Prophet Allah's instructions to the letter. Abu Bakr Siddiq said, Do what the Prophet of Allah ordered you to do. So begin with the land of Quda and then go to Abil today. Abil is situated in the southern part of Jordan. And do not be negligent regarding anything the Messenger of Allah commanded you to do. So do not be in a rush to get back, but instead make sure you carry out all of his orders before you embark upon your return journey. Usama radiallahu anhu then departed with his army and when he radiallahu anhu reached his intended destination, he sent out horses to attack the tribes of Quda'a and Abil. The expedition was a resounding success. Osama and his men completed their mission, were unharmed in the process, and took back with them much in terms of spoils of war. The entire expedition, both the journey to Asham and the return journey, lasted for 40 days. Harakul, the emperor of Rome, learned in a single message, both about the death of the Prophet wasallam and the arrival of Osama's army. The Romans, shocked at the sheer audacity of the attack on their land, exclaimed, What is the matter with them? Their companion dies, meaning the Prophet wasallam, and then they attack our lands. And the Arabs in the region said, If they were not powerful, they would not have sent this army against us. Thus the Arab Christians and Romans of the region were made to believe that the Muslims were quite powerful when in fact Abu Bakr Siddiq and the rest of the Muslims were struggling to regain control of the Arabian Peninsula. As a result of that false impression, the Romans refrained from attacking the Muslims as much as they had intended to do prior to the arrival of Osama's army. This consequence by itself proves that Abu Bakr Siddiq made the right decision in sending out Osama's army radiallahu anhu and his men to Asham. Inshallah, we will pick up from here on the next video. This is page number 328. 
the series of the military legendary legacy of the Prophet alayhi salatu wassalam, the era of Abu Bakr Siddiq, video number uh, 14. Wassalamu alaykum wa rahmatullah, subhanak allahumma wa bihamdik wa tabaraka asma rabbik, ta'ala jadduk wa la ilaha ghayruk wa la hawla wa la quwwat illa billahi al-ali al-azim, subhana rabbika rabbil izzati amma yasifun, wassalamun ala al-mursaleen wa alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen.